I invite you to stand as you are able and join me in the responsive call to worship as printed in your bulletin, which begins with all voices in unison. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have made the mountains, the seas, the skies. You have made the sun, the moon, and the stars. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have blessed us with food, with all creatures great and small. You have blessed us with plants, flowers, and trees. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. You are ever present, and we are ever in your care. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Please pray with me. Divine creator, from whom all things come, there is no place we can be that you are not present. We are truly blessed in your world, which you have pronounced good. We come together this morning to be transformed by your word and your presence into a renewed people for your ever-renewing creation. Amen. You may be seated. Our Bible reading this morning is from the book of Genesis, chapter 1, starting right at the beginning. Hear now these holy words from the Hebrew scripture. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and darkness 
he called night, and there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. We continue now with verses 26 through 31. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, see, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the air and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Bless the reading and the hearing of this holy word. morning. There's a long history of seeing God's revelation in two books, the Bible and nature, or scripture and science, or in the words of Francis Bacon, God's word and God's work. From the early church to the present, from Tertullian to Luther to contemporary authors, many have understood that God's revelation in one book should not, indeed it cannot, be in conflict with the other book. Thus, there should be consistency between scripture and science. This viewpoint is often what leads into what led individuals in Western civilization to pursue scientific understanding and to assume that the world would make sense because it was created by a God of order. If one looked to nature, one would not find things in contradiction to the Bible and the Bible would not be in conflict with what was discovered through science. So, what do we do when we seem to see science and scripture in conflict? How should we approach such a possibility? Indeed, sometimes science is viewed as a problem for the Bible and vice versa. But I would contend that such a problem, one between scripture and science, does not inherently have to exist. I would argue that the perceived problem often lies in our interpretation of both scripture and science. It is usually a result of either how we have been taught to read the Bible or when we try to make scripture say things beyond what it does that we find such a conflict coming to a head. In today's sermon on, in our faculty preaching series on theology and science, I want to focus on one text, the creation story as depicted in Genesis 1. I begin with the observation that there are many options for interpretation of this chapter and that the event that it describes the creation of the heavens and the earth. Several possibilities include young earth creationism, old earth creationism, the gap theory, progressive creationism, intelligent design, evolutionary theism, theistic evolution, among many possible approaches to understanding this text and often in its relationship to scientific models and the age of the earth, whether it's 4.5 billion years or 6,000 years old. My goal this morning is not to critique such views or to debate their merits. Instead, I want to focus on an option for understanding the Genesis 1 creation account that I have embraced, allowing me to both affirm God's word and God's work. 
In my view, this has explanatory power, namely situating the creation account of Genesis 1 in its ancient context, historical, literary, cultural, and most importantly, cosmological. I want to locate as best as one can the Genesis 1 creation account in its ancient setting and hear its claims as would its ancient recipients, the ones to whom the story was actually written. So assuming that the text actually meant something to the original audience, we might be better able to understand its meaning if we explore what they heard and how the text would have communicated truth in its ancient setting to that ancient audience. As we turn to Genesis 1, we discover that the Bible participates in the same ancient cosmology as was common throughout the ancient Near East. The understanding of how the universe exists is remarkably similar across cultures in the Mediterranean basin. While the details may shift slightly, the basic concept of the universe looks like this. The Earth is a flat disk surrounded by water on all sides. The earth either floats on the water, or more commonly, it is supported by pillars at the ends of the earth. There are also pillars holding up a dome or a firmament that prevents the waters above the earth from crashing down onto it. So what we call space, the ancients understood as water, and that makes perfect sense. The sky is blue and water in the form of rain comes down from there to the earth. And when you travel far enough in any direction, north, south, east, or west, what do you find? Water, whether a sea or a vast ocean. You start digging in the ground, you go down far enough, what do you find? Water, water under the earth. Again, this understanding of a flat disk surrounded by water makes sense as a result of empirical observation from an ancient scientific mindset. The sun and the moon move across the sky. The earth is fixed in one spot by those pillars under the dome. Various precipitation is stored in chambers and comes down to earth through windows or gates that open and close. This is consistent with various statements about the universe in Genesis 1 and throughout all of scripture, whether one is reading in Psalms, Job, Joshua, the prophets, and even the New Testament. This ancient three-tiered universe common across the ancient Near East is the cosmology we find in Genesis 1. Genesis is communicating truth in ways that make sense in its ancient setting. The similarity of cosmology is further reflected in the sequence of creation found in Genesis 1 and in other ancient Near Eastern creation accounts. The similarity to older creation accounts, and that's a little small, but there it is, um, as reflected in the Sumerian Atrahasis story and the related Babylonian Enuma Elish is well known. Apart from the context of creation as one of a cosmic battle, the Enuma Elish follows a very similar pattern to the account in Genesis 1. You can kind of see the similarity there. Lesser well known are the striking similarities to the two major Egyptian creation accounts, also older than what's written down in Genesis, even if Genesis comes from the hand of Moses. One derives from the city of Memphis. You can see there extremely similar patterns and uh, progression of, of the creation stories. And the other one comes from Hermopolis, the pyramid text and the coffin text, which are quite ancient. In his article, evangelical scholar Gordon Johnston makes a strong argument for the Egyptian accounts being even more consistent with and likely the major influences on the younger biblical version in Genesis 1. In addition to these striking similarities of sequence, the Babylonian and Egyptian accounts parallel Genesis with things like light being created prior to the creation of the sun, which has long been a detail that has troubled biblical interpreters. It's in those accounts too. Creation beginning with watery chaos that is then organized with the separation of water and dry land and the deity resting at the conclusion of creation. In contrast to the Babylonian Enuma Elish, the Egyptian accounts present the deity creating unopposed, not as the result of cosmic struggle and through the spoken word or even thought. So in that sense, the Egyptian account is much more similar to Genesis. In each case of these ancient examples, we see the creation of environments and then the population of those environments, or as Old Testament scholars such as Wheaton Professor John Walton terms it, forming and filling as can be seen in how the days of creation progress. Environments are formed, days one, two, and three, and then they are filled, days four, five, and six. 
In several recent publications, Walton has argued, and I think persuasively, that creation in the ancient world is primarily concerned with function, so that order is brought out of chaos for particular purposes. It is through identification of such function and therefore such purpose that creation's meaning in the ancient Near Eastern context is understood. It is precisely in this way that differences among the creation accounts point to how different functions and different purposes for creation and for humanity itself were expressed. So such differences are often tied explicitly to unique theological claims in Genesis 1. First, in the Babylonian account, creation is the result of a cosmic battle. And we'll move on here. So creation is the result of a cosmic battle in, in the Enuma Elish. To summarize the lengthy epic, this battle occurs between because, excuse me, because the young gods are being too noisy and disturbing the older gods who are trying to rest. Their mother, Tiamat, who exists in the form of a crab, a crustacean, indulges her children. Marduk, who would become the chief god of Babylon, is chosen by the other deities to subdue Tiamat and her demon children. Marduk, with the weapons of the storm and warrior god, defeats Tiamat and subsequently uses the empty pocket within her shell to create the new universe. Tiamat's shell thus forms the dome within which creation occurs, keeping back the waters of chaos. This victory solidifies Marduk's kingship, his right to rule over Babylon, and most importantly, Babylon's right to rule over all the earth. Of course, in Genesis, God creates unopposed, without a cosmic battle. In the Babylonian account, no value statement is made about the goodness of creation or its inhabitants. Creation simply exists, and it does so in service of Marduk and thus Babylon. This is in direct contrast to the Genesis account that repeatedly affirms the goodness of all creation in the well-known phrase, God saw it was good. Thus, the value of creation is clear in the Genesis version of events. Second, an important difference between the accounts are the statements about humanity's origins and purpose. In the Egyptian Memphite theology, the creation of humans is not given attention. They're simply among all of those who will serve the gods. In the Hermopolis version, humans are accidentally created from the god Atum's tears. It was not intentional, and no explicit purpose is given to human existence. The sun, in that account, is the image of the god Ra, and the pharaoh, as king of Egypt alone, will bear the image of God on earth. In the Babylonian account, Marduk creates humanity after Tiamat's defeat from the blood of a dead, rebellious god named Kingu, who is then put to death, as a result of his insurrection against the council of the gods. These humans are then created explicitly to serve as burden bearers of the gods so the deities can go back to their rest. This is not a high view of humanity in the Enuma Elish, in case you missed it. In contrast, of course, the Genesis 1 account proclaims that all of humanity is created in the image and likeness of God. This exact phrase with the exact same words is the label used in royal inscriptions for kings in the ancient Near East. As with Pharaoh in Egypt, the king alone bears the image of God. Genesis 1 then extends this royalty to all of humanity, both male and female, and regardless of social class or status. All of humanity bears the image of God in the biblical version. Therefore, humanity, every human person, has value and is good. Further, the task of humanity in Genesis 1 is to serve as God's emissary on earth, to have dominion, to rada in Hebrew, over the creation. This Hebrew verb rada has been misinterpreted, in my opinion, to say that humans can do whatever they want with creation, to exploit it, to use it however we see fit. However, this same verb rada is used across the ancient Near East and in the book of Psalms itself to indicate what good kings are supposed to do for their kingdoms. To rada, to have dominion, is to act as a king should over one's kingdom, ideally, for the benefit of everyone and everything within the realm. Thus, in Genesis 1, humanity is created as a monarch who is supposed to take care of what is entrusted to their supervision, the whole earth. Again, this places the role of acting like a ruler on the shoulders of all of humanity, Kingship, in a sense, has been democratized in God's actions in the biblical creation account. As good rulers, humanity is not supposed to exploit creation, for it is good, 
and we are supposed to keep it that way, tending to it and to all the creatures that inhabit it. As God's representatives, all of humanity should oversee creation the way that God would. In all of these details, it seems logical that the ancient audience would have heard the Genesis 1 account either knowing these alternative accounts or at least having caught the distinctive meaning and theology that is being offered by the biblical version. Given how these details interact with common understandings of kingship, creation, and the origin and function of humanity that are common in various other ancient Near Eastern creation accounts. This stuff is so common, people would have realized it right away. But what about God's resting on the Sabbath? While God does indeed rest at the end of creation in similarity to the other accounts, Genesis presents that rest differently. After entrusting creation to humanity, God's rest does not carry the sense of subjugation, but one of elevation for humanity. Indeed, there's no hint in Genesis 1 that the work of humanity is supposed to be laborious, that humanity is a burden bearer in the place of the deity, as in the Enuma Elish. It is not until the tragic events of Genesis 3 that humanity must now toil by the sweat of one's brow as the earth will resist humanity's attempts to do the very things that God has commanded humanity to do in Genesis 1. So the purpose, the function of God's rest in Genesis is different than what we find in the other creation accounts. And keeping our attention on God for the moment, I would note the importance of the Hebrew verb bara that is used three times in Genesis 1, translated create. It's worth pointing out that the subject of bara, create, throughout the entirety of the Hebrew Bible is always God. Now it's really rare that a grammatical or linguistic point is without a single exception, but that is indeed the case here. God alone is the subject of the Hebrew verb, and always, always it refers to God's creative activity. Theologically, whatever God does in creation is unique to God. The act of creation is seen to be the purview of God alone in the Hebrew Bible. Humans may participate with God or in God's ongoing creative acts, but humans do not bara. Nothing and no one else baras in the Hebrew Bible except God. This seems, in my opinion, to be an important theological claim about God's unique role in the creation of the universe. And this comment is related to my final point. The creation account in Genesis 1 is about who and not how. The only method of creation mentioned in Genesis 1 is God's spoken word. In forming the environments, God speaks their existence into being. God then speaks to the environments, which in turn produce their inhabitants, filling them. These acts of creation are done without any detail. The text is silent about the method or the process. The focus instead is on the God who creates, not the mechanism of how it happens. God does not provide us with an explanation of how Excuse me, Genesis does not provide us with an explanation of how, but it does concern itself with who. It also affirms the goodness of this creation in the sight of this God, intended by God to remain good, with valued humanity as God's representative to maintain it that way. At least that was the plan. Though these views of creation and humanity were a radical theological statement in the context of the ancient Near East, and it still should be so today, if we can hear the distinctive voice of this creation account instead of being concerned about proving whether the Bible and nature, science and scripture, are in contradiction or conjunction with one another. The Genesis account was not composed to answer that question, but to explain a distinctive view of creation in terms that its ancient audience would have understood and responded to accordingly. So let me reiterate the point that I hope I have made this morning. There does not need to be conflict between science and scripture, between God's word and God's work. It depends on the interpretive lens that we bring to the conversation. For me, interpreting Genesis 1 in the light of other ancient Near Eastern creation accounts provides a means to productively and positively engage modern science while respecting the biblical text for what it is saying theologically about the nature of creation and the creator who formed and filled it with purpose as being good. In my view, appreciating the biblical text for what it is saying in its ancient cosmological context 
is an important means of affirming both God's word and God's work as good and as two books that together reveal the glory of God even in our world today. Please join me in the Litany for Harmony as printed in your bulletin. Once again, beginning with all voices in unison. May all I say and all I think be in harmony with thee, God within me, God beyond me, maker of the trees. In me be the windswept truth of shore pine, fragrance of balsam and spruce, the grace of hemlock. In me, the truth of Douglas fir, straight, tall, strong trunked land hero of fireproof bark. Sheltering tree of life, cedar's truth be mine. Cypress truth, juniper aroma, strength of you. May all I sing and all I think be in harmony with thee, God within me, God beyond me, maker of the trees. In me be the truth of stream lover willow, soil giving alder, hazel of sweet nuts, wisdom branching oak. In me the joy of crabapple, grape maple, vine maple, cleansing cascara and lovely dogwood, and the gracious truth of the copper-branched arbutus, bright with color and fragrance, be with me on the earth. May all I say and all I think be in harmony with thee, God within me, God beyond me, maker of the trees. Amen.
We came to worship today to be transformed into a new people for a new creation. We carry that spirit within us out of this place and into God's glorious creation, singing songs of praise and thanksgiving. Go now in peace to love and serve the Lord by loving and serving the world. Amen.